Well, it's good to see everybody. I'm glad everyone is back. I'm glad everybody is here. Everyone have a good Thanksgiving? Eh? Yeah? All right, let me ask you this. How many ate way too much? Like, way too much. All right, but let me ask you this. Those of you that ate way too much, how many of you went back for seconds later than the evening and got way too much? That was me. So Bethany and I, we traveled down. Uh, we went down to North Carolina uh, to visit her family that is down there. And uh, there, it's an eight-hour drive. And so her, her parents run a program down there with uh, teenagers. And so there was, like, there was like seven turkeys that we had. And we had this buffet lined up. And I'm going to just tell you, I ate everything. I ate it all. And then I had seconds. I think I went back for thirds. And I just ate it all. The mashed potatoes. Her dad makes the best homemade mashed potatoes that you will ever have in your entire life. And uh, he made that, and we had a stuffing. But it was a, a, great, uh, a great time that we were there, and we just enjoyed it. And in where we were, there were so many people that where we were, there was a huge table that we had to take. And this table, we had to make it into like a, almost like a, a half of a square because there were so many people. And I don't know about you, but I was thinking about this recently, about Thanksgiving and Christmas and about how all of this works. And uh, how many of you still have to sit at the kid's table for Thanksgiving or Christmas? Still. So some of you are like, uh, I don't want to lose, man. Because I, like, when, when you think about this, if you come from a small family, you kind of all sit together. But if you come from a bigger family, there's usually like multiple tables. You know what I'm talking about? Like there's more tables than one. And then there's always this table and that table. And you're, all of your family comes in and then you got to figure out who you want to sit with and who you don't want to sit with. Because you know, like, you're like, man, like if I sit next to my sister or brother, I'm going to smash their face into this turkey in about two seconds. So I can't sit next to them. But then you got your cousin who you don't see very often. You're like, man, I want to sit with them because all you do is make fun of your dad and your mom and like all that stuff, you know, and you cut up. And then there are people that you're just like, you know what, I'm going to go sit over here and they're going to sit over there. But I was thinking about this concept about how sometimes during the holidays, there are separate places where we sit. There's different tables. There is an adult table. There is a kid's table. Sometimes there's like a, a youth table if you have that many people in your family. But I remember specifically growing up because our family was so big and there's so many of us that would have Thanksgiving. I remember that time when you transition from sitting at the kid's table to sitting at the adult table. But let's just pause for a minute. Do you know the kids table, it's like, I swear what they do is they find like the old table that they left outside in the playground. You know that like little tykes table I'm talking about where you can barely fit your knees down into it. It's that white and blue one that, you know, and they leave it out. They leave it out in the yard all year round and they hose it off when it comes to Thanksgiving. Or what about a card table? How many of you ever had like one of those little square card tables? That's what you have to eat at. And your parents are at the nice big table and you're sitting at the card table, hitting your knees off of everything and shaking the table every time you get up. Like... There's always these tables that we're moving to and we're moving from, but as you get older, you find your place at the adult table. You find your place at this table where you're able to be there, and it's a big deal because now you're an adult, kind of. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, but sometimes you get to the adult table and you're like, I'm going back to the kids' table because this adult table sucks. Like, you are boring. You're talking about politics and weather. Like, I'm going back here. We're going to talk about, like, all, all the fun stuff and all of that. But every holiday that we have and any events that we go to, and if you've ever gone to banquets, if you've ever gone to benefits, if you've ever gone to big things, there's tables that you go to and that you sit at, and there are all these, all these things. And there'll be designated tables that they're like, okay, you have to sit here. You have to sit there. And, and if we're honest, it's not exactly like the table itself that is nice. It's not the fact that like I'm moving from a, a card table or a little tykes table to a big wooden table. Now that's not it. What changes is whose table I'm sitting at. That's, that's what changes it. It's that shift from sitting at the little kid's table to sitting at the adult table because I'm no longer with the kids, but I'm with the adults. So it's not really the type of table, but it's at whose table you're at. 
I know for me, I always like to sit at, I always like to sit at a table that my brother-in-law Seth is in, because he's just one of the funniest people, and we have so much fun. And so usually wherever he's sitting, I try to kind of sit where he's sitting, because I know we're going to be able to talk, laugh, goof around. Same thing, if he's not there, my little brother's shoulder, I'm looking for where he's sitting, because we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have fun. And so a lot of times when we pick where we sit at a table, it's not about the type of table or what's on the table, but it's at whose table they're sitting at. It's whose table is there. Like, think about it. When you go into the cafeteria or you have to sit, like, you want to look for your friends. You're not going to go sit with a bunch of people that you don't know. Well, you may. But most of us want to sit at a table because of who's at the table and whose table it is. And how many of you know, like, tables are different. Tables are different. Like, you have your table at your house and how it is with your family, and then you go to grandma's house, and grandma's got a different set of rules at her table. But then you can go to somewhere else, and like, like you can eat certain stuff at your house, at your table, that they won't serve at grandma's house, at grandma's table. Or you can go to your aunt and uncle's, and they're not going to serve it. Or you go to your friend's house, and they're not going to serve the same thing. And it's not going to be. So it's all different on how all these tables are. But it's always important whose table you're sitting at. That's what we look for. We really are drawn to that when you go to places of whose table that you're going to be at. It's about sitting at the table. It's about having fellowship and hanging out and enjoying who's there. Well, the Bible tells a very interesting story about a table. And not just a table, but a very specific table. But before I talk to you about that table, I need to give you kind of a little bit of background information. So in the Old Testament, there's a story about this guy named King Saul. King Saul is the king. He's the first king of Israel. He's, he's, he's who God chose. But King Saul begins and starts strong and starts really good as the king. But then what begins to happen is King Saul begins to think more of himself than of God. And he begins to rule Israel in a completely wrong way. He becomes actually disobedient to what God wants him to do. So God says, all right, King Saul, like your reign is going to come to a close. You're going to be done. I'm going to anoint a new king. And a lot, we've talked about this guy a lot here, and you probably heard him. This guy, that, his name is David. David who killed Goliath. David who was a mighty man of God. David who was a man after God's own heart. God said, I'm going to choose David to be the next king. And so all of a sudden you have this story that we're going to jump into tonight where King Saul is at war with his, and, his, and his son is with him and they're at war and they're fighting and, king da and, and David is getting ready to become king and everyone knows this is happening. Now normally, if I was the king and I knew someone was trying to come and take my throne, I would want to kill off their family. I'm just being real. That's how it went back then. If you were coming for my throne, I was going to get rid of you. I was going to destroy you and your entire family. But here's the problem. King Saul's son is Jonathan. And Jonathan is David's best friend. So we have a problem here. And this is where we're going to jump into the story tonight. Check this out. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 4. Now Jonathan, had a son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came to Jezreel that they had died. His nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, she dropped him and he fell and became disabled. His name was Mehebesheth. So what's happening here is King Saul and his son Jonathan are out in the battlefield and they die. So what happens is a messenger runs from the battlefield and runs into the palace and says to King Saul's family, hey, your husband died, the, the king has died, his son has died, so David is going to come and he's going to take the throne. So in a panic, King Saul's family begins to get everything they can together to run away because they think that David is going to kill all of them. Well, in the story, we see, and you read it on the screen, that there is a little baby or, or a little boy who was only five years old. And when the news heard that King Saul had died, a nurse grabbed this little five-year-old and began to run out with him and dropped him, physically dropped him. And when she dropped him, it ended up breaking his legs and breaking his feet. And so he became disabled, and his name was Mehebesheth. He was dropped. I want you to understand tonight in this story, Mehebesheth was only five years old and he was dropped. 
And as I'm, I'm reading this story and I'm thinking about it, 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 Mehebesheth was dropped by someone. But oftentimes we know that when something happens in us in our life that makes us dropped or something happens that makes us feel like we're not the same like everybody else, we begin to feel like we're not worthy because we're not like everybody. I mean, I can only imagine what, when Mehebesheth and his rest of his family, they left and they went off into the wilderness and they hid in his city for years and years and years because they were terrified that if David found them, David would kill them. But imagine being Mehebesheth. Imagine being this little boy who used to be able to run and play and skip and jump and run and do all these things, and now all of a sudden you can't. Imagine him going to, trying to go to school. All the other kids can do all these things and he can't. All the other kids can do all these crazy things and have all these fun, and he can't. Why? Because of something that has happened to him. And he feels so unworthy. He feels like, you know what, I just, I, because what has happened to me, I'm not worthy enough to be able to be able, included in everything that goes on. And I begin to think about this and how so often in life what I am seeing is I am seeing a generation of young people beginning to believe that they are not worthy because something has happened. I want everyone to look at me tonight because I want you to get this. Some things happen in our life sometimes where we've been dropped maybe by life, by something in our life. A situation happens that's so, uh, so terrible and so horrible that it causes us to feel like we don't matter much anymore. It causes us to feel like we don't have worth. It causes us to feel like we're not worthy enough anymore to, to be accepted. And, and we have things that happen, and, and you know, we, we know that this is what God had. We had something that God wanted to do. There is a plan, but in somehow, some way, it got messed up. Whatever it was, there was a drop in your life that makes you feel like you are not worthy. And let me be completely honest with you. Some of us have been dropped. Some of us have had things in our life where it was outside of our control that someone has done something to us that has caused us to feel unworthy. But don't get it twisted. There are those of us in this room that have made decisions to do things on our own, and because of our own decisions, then we feel like we're unworthy. Because we've dropped ourselves. And I begin to think about this whole concept of, of Mehebesheth and, and what's going on. And, and there's so many things that happen in life, especially as you get older. I'm seeing so many of my friends that are adults, man, they're losing their jobs. They're, 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 they're being lied about. They're, there's all these things that are going on. And, and then I look at all the teenagers and the young adults that I'm, I'm doing life with all the time, and I'm seeing all these things happen where you have people that were in our relationships and then something happened and they're no longer there because of someone cheating or an infidelity. And then the, my friends that are back battling addictions, and then I got friends that are, are battling genetic diseases, and I got all these things that are happening in life, and because of that situation, because of that thing, because of that one part that happened, they feel like they're not worthy. They feel like they're not worthy. And this is exactly how Mehebesheth felt. This little boy grew up into a young man who grew up into an old man. And imagine for decades of your life feeling like you're not good enough. Imagine for decades believing that you're not worthy. Well, it goes on to say in 2 Samuel, it says in chapter 9, verse 3, Then the king, who is King David at this time, decades have gone by. King David says, is there still not someone of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? The kindness of God. And Ziba, who was his, one of his uh, advisors, said to the king, Well, there is still the son of Jonathan, Mehebesheth, who is the lame man in both of his feet. So here what we have is Mehebesheth grew old, decades have gone by. He's living in the wilderness in some city outside somewhere. And King David is now king. And he said, you know what? I remember my friendship with Jonathan. I remember that he was my best friend. I remember that I cared about him. Is there no one left of his family that I can literally show the kindness of God to? He was saying, is there not someone out there that I literally can go and help and find? And, and, and it's so funny because we have the drop, but then this is the pickup. The pickup is that there is King David who's looking to say, I need to show kindness to this guy's family. 
I need to show kindness on the sake of my friend Jonathan. And, and he picked up, why? Because the loving nature of the king. King David was not like all the other kings. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. And he wanted to show kindness. And I want you to understand something tonight. We serve a God that is a God of grace. It's the very nature of God that he so loved the world that he sent his son. And so you got to understand in this story what's going on. Mehebesheth is living in the wilderness, and this is a guy that feels like he is not worthy. Mehebesheth is not looking for the king, but the king is looking for Mehebesheth. So someone is living in the wilderness who feels like he doesn't matter, feels like he doesn't have any worth, feels like he's unworthy because what has happened to him, and now the king is looking for him to show him the worth that he has. How many times in our life are we in situations and places where we feel like we have no worth, where we feel like we don't matter, where we feel like what is going on and what is happening is not, is, it just doesn't matter anymore, and we live in a place far from thinking that anyone is looking for us, only to find out that God is looking for us. King David goes out of his way to find Mehebesheth. In the very same way, God finds us in that wilderness place. And the king of kings says, no, I sent my son Jesus to die on a cross for you so that you can realize how much you're worth. I have come to seek and to save that which is what? Lost. Lost. That actively means that God is looking for us to show us how much worth we really have. That means that God is looking and saying, hey, where are these people that I can show kindness to? I'm going to send my son Jesus to die for them, but they need to know how much they're worth. But what's interesting is in this story, when King David is searching for Mehebesheth, he's in a place that is called Lo Debar. Lo Debar. It was a city that was east of the Jordan River, and the whole entire area of Lodabar is a wasteland. It literally means, I want you to catch this tonight, Lodabar literally means the place of no bread or no provision. So you have a man who believes that he is unworthy living in a wasteland that means there is no provision for me. There's no bread. No bread. Nothing for me to eat. So Mehebesheth was hiding in this desolate place. And, and I think about it again, how often do we do this? We end up in a desolate place. And our desolate place not, might not be called low debar, but it's called anxiety. It's called fear. It's called depression. It's called feeling insecure. See, we all have places that we will escape to and that we will live in, believing that that place is our permanent place of residence. We will all go to a place where feeling like a victim and say, I'm going to live there and that's gonna be the place that I'm going to live and I'm gonna do my life. And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, man, like this is like, this is where, this is, this is so relevant to us today because it, like David did not wait for Jonathan's son to come out of the desolate place. But Jonathan sent his, or uh, David sent his people into the desolate place. Go in and find where, these, where this guy is. Go into Lo Tabar, the place of no provision, and show up and do something and show them what they're worth. And like him, we live in a, a desperate place, but God says, no, I'm going to send, I'm going to send Jesus into this desolate place to find you. And it's so funny to me that lo debar means a place of no bread. And Jesus literally says, I am the bread of life. So where you're camping out in your anxiety and your fear, and you're camping out in these places in your life because the, something has happened to you, you had a drop, where something happened that makes you feel unworthy, it makes you feel like you don't matter, and then all of a sudden, God says, no, I'm gonna find you in that place, in the place that you feel like there's no bread, no life, no provision. I'm gonna send Jesus, who literally the definition of his name means provision and life. And this is what Jesus has for each and every one of us, is this provision of life to, to be in us. When Jonathan's men roll up on the scene and they find Mehebesheth, they bring him to the palace. 
And in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 9, verses 7 through 8, this is what we find. David says, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all of the land of Saul, your grandfather. And you shall what? Eat bread at my table continually. Mehebesheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should take on and notice a dead dog like me? I'm gonna hit that here in a minute. Understand that David loved Mehebesheth from the very beginning. Not for his own sake, not for anything that Mehebesheth did or didn't do, but he loved him for the sake of who his father was, Jonathan. That's why he loved him. His love for Jonathan extended through generations to Jonathan's descendants to say, I'm gonna share the love that I have with your father. I'm gonna share it with you. In much the same way, God loves each and every one of us not for his son's sake, his son's sake, Jesus. We don't have to earn his love. We already have his love. We already have Jesus. We already have all the things that we need. But David showed an unexpected mercy and grace to Mehebesheth when he didn't need to. Because what he could have done, he could have brought Mehebesheth in and been like, oh, you're the last member of Saul's family and he could have killed him right there. And then the threat of him ever taking over the throne would be gone. And King David could live at peace knowing that nobody was coming for the throne. But he shows this unexpected thing. And, and I want to keep, put that, let's put that verse back on because this is what he says. He says, what is it that you should notice a dead dog like me? I want everyone to pay attention to that. Everyone pay attention to what he's saying. Mehebesheth accepted what he thought he was because he didn't feel worthy. So he felt like, you know what? I'm not even a live dog. I'm a dead dog. I'm a dead dog. All of you in this room, if you've been around me long enough to know, you know that I have one dog in my life that I love more than anyone else's dog, and that is my dog, Timber. That's my boy. That's my dog. I love my dog, Timber. He is my fur baby. He is my son. I will, I will do things for that dog I won't even do for people. If you come over to my house and you tell my dog to move off the couch, I will tell you to move off the couch. That's his couch. I love my dog. And, and I think about, and I'm reading this passage, I'm thinking about how alive my dog is and how much energy he has and how he's full of life. And Mehebesheth is saying, I, my existence, my life is that of a dead dog, one that doesn't even matter, one that has no life, one that has no being. And this is what he is saying. How can you love a dead dog like me? Well, when you look at this, Mehebesheth name, his name, Mehebesheth means shamed one. Shamed one. Man called himself a dead dog, and he allowed himself to accept the fact that he was a man of shame, and he took his shame to a desolate place. See, what happened to Mehebesheth, he allowed the drop to define his life. I want everyone to understand that. Sometimes us as humans, what we do, we allow one situation that has happened to us or that we were in, we allow that one moment to define our life. And I want you to think about a clock. I want you to think about how a clock works and how a clock ticks and how you have all of these seconds that go within a minute, that goes within minutes, that goes within a half an hour, that goes within an hour, and you have these ticks that go through an entire clock. See, what happens to us is in this, in this whole clock, we allow one moment, one second of the pain of what happens in our life to stop the clock. You ever walk into a house and you notice the clock isn't the right time? And you're like, okay, you need to fix that clock. And you need to, you need to adjust that clock because that clock's not right. And the clock, what it did is it, when it died, it stayed at that time. How many times do we do this in our lives? Do we allow one situation, one mistake, one incident to stop us in our life? to stop us in the brokenness of our life. We go through life day after day, month after month, year after year, but we're still stuck in that one second of brokenness of what has happened to us. That one second we were dropped. We allow that to define us. 
See, Mehebesheth allowed that to stop his life. Mehebesheth proceeded to live in a broken place, in a broken moment, and believed that that's who he was. The King David said, no, this isn't going to happen. Look what it says in verse 13. (coughs) Go ahead and put that on the screen, if you don't mind. So Mehebesheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. Wow, this is a really a drastic turn of what we were just reading about. It really kind of just jumps to this verse. So Mehebesheth dwelt in Jerusalem, and he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame in both feet. See, King David said, you know what? No, because of Jonathan, I'm going to show you kindness and I'm going to show you goodness. So what he did is he moved Mehebesheth from the desolate place, from the place that had no bread, into the palace and said, listen, I'm going to give you all the inheritance of your grandfather who was the king. So all this land over here, that's yours. All this provision is yours. All these servants is yours. All these riches are yours. This guy went from one day having nothing to one day having half the kingdom. And King David said, I do this because I loved your father. So imagine this, man. Imagine like, oh, it is dinner time. I don't know what time you eat. We eat kind of early. So let's say five o'clock. Five o'clock, it's dinner time. All right? And all of a sudden, that dinner bell starts ringing in that palace. And I, I don't know how, what, it was probably very elegant. It probably wasn't like what we have. But can you imagine dinner time at the palace? Can you imagine what that would be like? I'm sure that King David is ushered in by all these guards. Like all these guards are lined up and these guards are like the baddest dudes around and they're guarding him and they come in and they sit King David down at the table. He's the head of the table. Then his probably his kids come in and probably all the other advisors come in and you have all these people that are gathered and perhaps there are King David's children are running around and they're trying to find where they're gonna sit. And you know, maybe Joab, who's one of the courageous warriors, uh, King David is sitting at his right side and then King David's wife is sitting on his left and they're getting ready and all of these beautiful people are in the dining hall getting ready because it's dinner time then all of a sudden down the hallway you hear the shuffling of uneven footsteps you know that that's the hallway that Mehebesheth lives at and you can hear him shuffling down the crippled footsteps of this man who, who thought that he didn't matter, this crippled footsteps of this man that thought that he had no worth, this crippled footsteps of this man who thought that he had nothing to live for and had no provision, and all of a sudden he sits down at the table of the king. At the table of the king, he's just like the rest of them. He sits there. And it's an interesting picture to paint and to think about because you have all of this royalty, all of these people that look like they have it together. And then Mehebesheth comes and sits. It makes me think about you and me. Where do we fit at the table? Where's our place at the table? See, in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 22, this is what it says. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred on me. So that you may eat, excuse me, <coughs> eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And what does it say? And sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It begins to remind me about how things are with God. And, and it began to make me think about the table, really, in all essence. And that's why I had Zeth leave the table up. Because at tables are interesting things like we were talking about in the beginning. And you have all this royalty that's sitting at the table. And then when Mehebesheth comes in, Mehebesheth comes in and they place his seat at the table with everybody else. And everyone's kind of lined up. And when Mehebesheth comes and he sits down at the table, when he sits at the table, he is equal to all that are at the table. And when Mehebesheth sits at the table, there's one thing that you don't notice. You don't notice his legs. You don't notice that he's crippled. You don't notice that he's been dropped. You don't notice that he has issues. You don't notice that he is crippled. You don't notice all these things because you're sitting at the table and you are equal to everyone that is at the table with you. When Mehebesheth sat at the table, he was just as much royalty as anyone else who sat at that table. 
And really, when I begin to think about that, it really began to show me a picture in my mind about something that is, that is really different, that is really, that is really a, a amazing, is that when they would come to the table, it didn't matter what the issues were, they were at the table. And so for you, if you're in this room tonight and you're thinking like, hey, my life, I've gone through some stuff and maybe I've been abused. Well, I want you to know tonight that if you've been abused, there's a place at the table for you. Maybe some of you have been through some issues and had some things go on and you've self-inflicted, you've had some things that happen and it makes you feel like you're not worthy and you feel rejected. Well, if you feel rejected tonight, I want you to understand that there's a place at the table for those that feel rejected. There's a place at the table for victims. There's a place at the table that where people might feel rejected for who they are. For those of you that feel like, you know what, just because I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not insecure, well, I want you to understand tonight that even at the table, for those that feel insecure, there's a place at the table. Because when you're sitting at the table, there's one thing that you have to understand. There's someone that sits at the head of the table. And the one that sits at the head of the table is Jesus. It's God. It's the king. And it's his table that you sit at. So you go from someone that, that feels like I'm not worthy enough, someone that feels like I have no provision, to someone who's sitting at the table with the king. And that's what's so amazing about the table. So you understand that the food is great at the table. The service is probably great. The decorations are probably great, but that doesn't matter. What matters is whose table you're at. Pastor Jacob, if you could come. What matters is whose table you begin to sit at. Because for all of us, we all have issues. We've been forgotten. We've been violated. We've, been, we've had issues. We've come from addictions. And even in our world that we're living in, if you're not vaccinated, if you are vaccinated, if you think this way, if you think that way, if you're from here, if you're from there, if your skin color is this, if your skin color is that, we have all of these things that are making us feel like we're not worthy enough. And all God wants you to do is realize that you have a place at the table. You have a place at the table. Young ladies in this room, I want you to understand, you have a place at the table. The insecurity, the feeling like you're not good enough, feeling like you're inferior, feeling like that you have to live up to some type of certain image to be someone. You have to live up to this certain persona that the world tells you you have to live, and you, and you battle with this and that and go back and forth. Well, I want you to know that, young lady, you have a place at the table. Gentlemen that are here tonight, those that feel like you have to live a certain way to, to look and picture yourself, to be this successful, money-making man and have to have all of these things and your insecurity is acted out through your immaturity, guess what? You have a place at the table. Those of us that have been broken and hurt, those of us that have been victims, those of us that have thought that because what has happened to us, we can't be accepted into where God is. We have a place at the table. See, we have to understand that God has given us this invitation to come to the table. And the invitation in itself tells us the worth that we have. And all he's saying is come to the table. And we think, oh man, but you, like I, I don't deserve that place at the table. I don't deserve to have fellowship with God. I don't deserve for him to love me. I don't deserve for him to, to do this. And God, it, it doesn't matter. I've set you a place at the table. God says, I set you a place at the table. So we have to understand that no matter what you have gone through, no matter what you are going through, you have a place at the table. You might have make, made one mistake after the next mistake after the next mistake, and you keep making mistakes, and you keep doing it to yourself, and you get so frustrated. I want you to know you have a place at the table. I'm tired of seeing a generation feel like that they don't have a place. I'm tired of young people feeling like they don't have a place where they can't be connected and sit where God is. Each and every person that walks this planet, that has walked this planet, that will walk this planet, has an invitation to sit at the table. 
They have an invitation to sit at the table. And see, what's great is when we sit at the table and it's you and me at the table, it doesn't matter anything else. It matters that we're at the table. I'm screwed up. I'm jacked up. I've had things happen. But it doesn't matter because I'm at the table. And I'm at the table with the king. And as long as the king has invited me, I'm part of that royalty. I go from a place where I live where there's no bread to the place where there's everlasting bread. I go from living in a place feeling of insecure to a place of security. I go from living in a place where I feel like I have no worth to sitting at a table that, is, that, that literally the man's table tells me how much I'm worth. I can go from living in a place of fear and anxiety and depression to sitting at a table to the one that can guide me through each and every one of those. Because see, there's something about sitting at the king's table that brings us security. Like, no one's going to mess with me. No one's going no to bother me. I'm not going to feel unworthy anymore because I sit at his table. I want you to understand tonight that you have a place at the table. That's all that I want you to get tonight. No matter what has happened to you, no matter what you have done, no matter what you've walked through, you have a place at the table. You have to accept that place. You have to accept that invitation that says, yes, I will sit at the king's table. See, I think some of us, what we do is, is, is we're like, oh man, I got that invitation. I'm gonna come sit at the king's table and I'm gonna sit down and the king has prepared this beautiful meal for us and this meal is great. It's like a, probably like a 500 course meal that is so amazing, best food you ever had. But some of us sit at the table and we just take an appetizer and say, okay, thanks, I gotta go. And we go back to the place that we don't belong. Some of us come and we just eat part of the meal. I gotta eat and run. I, I know what it is to feel worthy. I know what, God kind of loves me, but, but God, I got to go. See, what God is saying is he's saying, listen, sit at the table. Stay seated at the table. Stay here at the table so you can know how much I love you. Stay at the table. Sit at the table so you can realize all that I have for you. But you see, it's not just about eating at the table but it's about who's speaking at the table. Someone who's speaking value over you, love over you, life over you. So across this room, if you could bow your heads and close your eyes, nobody looking around. I know this message is a little intense for coming back off of a break. But just over the last several days, I've seen so many things on social media and I've talked to so many people that have feel like, you know what, I just don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I matter. I don't feel like I have a place because what has been done to me or what I have done or any of these things. And I wanna let you know tonight that God covers those things. There's a table that you can go to and all the mess and all the brokenness and all those things that you have, you can sit at the table and put it under that table and sit with the king and sit with God and be in relationship with him. The king desires for you to sit at the table. See, the table, if you haven't got it, is a metaphor for our relationship with God. And this is one message that God wants us to hear is that he wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to love you and, and be there for you and connect with you. God desires for you to understand how much value you have. God desires for you to understand that you have worth and that you matter and that God has a plan for you. And that plan is an amazing plan that he's gonna bless you. But all you have to do is accept the invitation and sit at the table. Because he loves you. because he cares for you. For some of you, what has happened to you is horrific 
and I, I, my heart breaks for some of the situations that you've walked through. But don't allow that moment to define you. Don't allow the clock to stop in that moment. Don't allow you to live in that place that you're not created to live in. Don't allow yourself to be in that place that you shouldn't be in. Don't accept the name. Don't accept that. Accept the fact that there is a king searching for you. Let that king find you. Let that king restore you. Let him bring him back to relationship. Let him know what true, ultimate security and love feels like. The love of God. So tonight, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, will you accept the invitation to sit at the table? It's all you have to do is accept that invitation to sit at the table. For some of us, we've accepted that invitation and we've been to that table before, but we find ourselves going back and forth from that table to other tables or from that table to something else that doesn't matter. And we go back and forth. Well, tonight, God just wants you to sit at his table. He wants you to know tonight that he loves you. He wants you to know tonight that he assigns value to your life. You are worthy. You are lovely. You are wonderful. The Bible says that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. If God has said that about us, why would we believe what the world says about us? God has imprinted the beauty and the grace and the majesty of who he is on our lives. Yet we choose to, to like really accept the false labels the world throws on you. Well, tonight, we are called to eat, to live, to be at the king's table. So maybe you're here tonight and that's you. You're Mehebesheth. Maybe that's tonight, that's you. You said, hey, Pastor Michael, when you're talking about that dead dog, I can, I can relate more to that dead dog than I can to that live dog. You talked about living in that broken part, that broken moment. That's where I live. Well, tonight we're calling you out of that place and God is calling you to the table. He's calling you to live at the place that he is destined for you to live. So if that's you tonight, I'm gonna pray and I want you just to pray with me. I'm not gonna ask anyone to come forward. I'm not gonna ask anyone to do anything because I don't wanna embarrass anyone tonight because some of us, we got some things that's going on. We got some things that are happening. Are there leaders that will pray with you? Yes. Are there people that will talk with you? Yes. And we'll be here for you. We're available. But know tonight that you're worthy. Know tonight that you have a place at the king's table. But if it's you tonight and you're feeling like Mehebesheth, I want you to pray with me. And you can just repeat after me. Say, dear God, I'm living in a place where I shouldn't be. And I know that you've come looking for me. And I want a place at your table. I want a place to feel worthy. I want a place to feel secure. I want a place to feel safe. I want a place to feel like I have purpose. So God, forgive me of the things that I have done and help me to live this life the way that you desire me to live. Help me to love you more and to love people more. God, tonight that's our prayer, Lord. And, I, and God, I just pray tonight that each and every person that is in this room understands that you have called them worthy. You have given them an invitation to sit at the table. And Lord, I pray tonight that that will be something that they will seal to their hearts and to their souls, that there is nothing. The Bible says that there is nothing that can separate you from the love that Jesus has for you. Nothing. And so, God, I pray tonight that you will seal this to our hearts and that we will have an understanding that we have a place at the table. 
and we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. <clears throat> I want you to know tonight, before you walk out of this room, before we put on our Christmas music, before we jump out, I want you to just understand tonight that you are worthy. See, I love that we sing that God is worthy. I love that we sing that. But us accepting Jesus and being in relationship with him makes us worthy too. So you are worthy tonight. You have value. You matter. And you have a place at the table. And I hope it's a place near me. I hope it's a place where we can all be together. And the thing is, is we're in it together. We're at the table. We're doing this thing. We're walking in relationship with one another, closer to God. Not just leaving people behind, but as a group together, loving God, trying to do this the best we can. Because that's what we do, and that's who we are. So God, thank you for these people, every one of them. Thank you for students and leaders. God, I pray that as we leave tonight and as we go throughout this Christmas season, God, that you will allow us to have this understanding that we have value. That we have an invitation to sit at your table. And God, I just thank you and praise you that we are called royalty by you. So God, bless us as we go. Bless our conversation. Keep us safe. God, keep us healthy, spiritually, mentally, physically. In all these things we pray. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen.